I'm Rich Levy from the great class of 1974, and I'm pleased to... Yeah! I'm pleased to welcome everybody back for Reunion Weekend and for these, these alumni seminars this morning. As the classes of the fours and nines reconvene this weekend to reconnect with classmates, teachers in the college, and renew ties to the Society of Alumni, the world's oldest alumni organization, that's it. Let's hear it. Yeah. I'm especially privileged this morning to introduce one of my own classmates as your first speaker. And having heard his presentation last fall, I can say that you're in for a real treat. In keeping with William's great pedagogical tradition, I want to begin by posing some questions, rhetorical ones, but inquiries that are entirely appropriate to provide some context about Bruce Beeler. How many of us have wondered over the years since we left the Purple Valley, did I really choose my life's work? Did I really follow my true calling? Did I really pursue that burning interest, that passion that captivated me in my adolescence? If I could start all over again, after Williams, of course, would I do the same thing? For Bruce Beeler, the answer to each of those questions is a resounding yes. To inform the answer, let me take you back to another era at Williams, when the class of 1974 was in residence. And my apologies to those few, of you, few alumni in the audience who weren't even born yet. In those days, many of, many of us spent long hours glued in front of the television, a non-credit-bearing activity despite the required serious time commitment. I can still hear the voice of William Shatner at the beginning of each episode of the weekly reruns of the original Star Trek as he delivered one of the most famous lines ever recorded for television, albeit one of the most grammatically incorrect. The five-year mission of the Starship Enterprise is stated by Captain James T. Kirk to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new lives and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. This seemingly trite phrase is quite suited to our purpose this morning because Bruce Bueller's work personifies its ideals. Long before he ever set foot on the Williams campus, Bruce knew the direction he would travel, the quests he would pursue, and the interests that would define his life. As he said at the start of a lecture in Westchester County last fall, when I was about five years old, looking out the window of our house in the suburbs of Baltimore, Maryland, I saw a red-bellied woodpecker, and I knew right then and there what I wanted to do with my life. That spark carried Bruce from fledgling to adult through Williams and beyond to the career about which he remains passionate. An American Civilization major here at Williams, Bruce received a Thomas J. Watson traveling fellowship that took him to New Guinea in 1975, on the first of what now numbers more than 40 trips to the Southwest Pacific and South Asia to study the birds of the region. Building on his Watson work, Bruce received his master's and doctoral degrees in biology from Princeton University, and he honed, it, honed his experience over the next three decades in a series of public and private sector positions dedicated to ornithology, tropical ecology, biogeography, and conservation. Ten years at the Smithsonian Institution, including service as, the, as scientific assistant to the secretary of the Smithsonian, stints at the Wildlife Conservation Society, Counterpart International, and the U.S. Department of State, and the last eight years at Conservation International, where Bruce is currently the senior research scientist at the Center for Applied Biodiversity Science in Arlington, Virginia, where he focuses on the impact of climate change on tropical biodiversity. A world-renowned expert on the birds of Papua New Guinea and a frequently published scientific author, Bruce has been interviewed many times by the national and international media, and by my count, he has authored six books, including his most recent, Lost Worlds, Adventures in the Tropical Rainforest, published last year by Yale University Press. In 2005, a team led by Bruce to the Foya Mountains of western New Guinea identified and classified literally dozens of new species of plants and animals varieties of life never before seen by anyone except the indigenous population of that region. In a profile of Bruce broadcast on CBS News program 60 Minutes in December 2007, viewers were treated to the striking examples of the strange new worlds, new life, and new civilizations successfully sought out by Bruce and his colleagues. And based on the results of that expedition, National Geographic Adventurer magazine named him one of its 12 Adventurers of the Year for 2005, calling him a modern-day Darwin. And by the way, even the National Geographic Society sees the merit of describing Bruce's work through the allusion to Star Trek, which I discovered just last week. <laughs> One way or another, Williams has always figured into Bruce's work. One Williams alumnus in particular played and continues to play a key role in Bruce's pursuit of his lifelong work. Bruce says, 
The fact that Fred Rudolph, a history teacher, encouraged me to do my senior honors thesis on the bird life of the Adirondacks of New York State made all the difference, allowed me to get the Watson Traveling Fellowship, which allowed me to have the career I have today. Fred, a member of the Great Knight Class of 1942, remains a presence in Bruce's life and helped to edit his most recent book. So what motivates Bruce? For the answer, go out into the field with him in his own words. Yang Su Camp, Papua, Indonesia. Here I was in western New Guinea. A light rain pattered on the roof of my green mountain tent. It was dark. Supper was best forgotten. I was content for a number of reasons. I was happy because I was dry. It's hard to stay dry in a rainforest. I was pleased because I, would, I was at ease and comfortable. Getting around in a rainforest office means straining and sweating a lot. I was satisfied because it was night and I could listen to the waves charging up the White Coral Beach where the forest meets the sea. Even the sound of light rain was pleasant in this state of restful bliss. I was gratified to be once again in the tropical jungle. It wasn't because of the food, certainly. It wasn't because of the local trail system, which seemed designed to kill off this middle-aged ornithologist. It wasn't the superb views of Papuan forest birds. What then was my motivation? It was in part to peer back into a time machine. For where in my Maryland homeland could I gaze out at an ancient hardwood forest? It was a place to visit where the aboriginal inhabitants had not been driven off the land. It was a place to be where each day I needed to test my body in ways not available except in the environs of Washington, D.C., except perhaps in a health club. It was the challenge of getting to understand how these complex ecosystems were put together and how they functioned. And finally, it was the absolute necessity of determining how, determining how the best of these rainforests could be preserved for generations to come so that our great-grandchildren could hear the rainforest whisper its secrets. We're delighted to have Bruce here this morning to share his perspectives on 30 years of exploring the lost worlds of New Guinea. Please welcome my classmate, Bruce Buehler. Thank you very much. That's, That's very, very fine. fine. Rich, thanks so much. That's wonderful. Was that really me? I'm not sure. That just doesn't seem possible. But a lot of that is because of Williams. And really, you know, for me, it's a great opportunity to be here to say thank you to Williams and the wonderful Williams alumni who've made this such a fantastic institution. And I gaze out here and see people I know and people I don't know, but it's really a wonderful feeling just, just to be here. Now, of course, the bad news is, is Rich stole most of my best stories. <laughs> and uh, so it's going to be a very short presentation probably today. But I am going to time myself to make sure I don't go over. How many of you out there, raise your hand if you've been to New Guinea. Anybody been to New Guinea? I know a few people out there have been to New Guinea. Okay, yeah, I see. So how many people were in New Guinea during the war, World War II? Not too many. I see one. I... I'm going to talk about a different New Guinea. New Guinea of World War II was not a place any sane person wanted to be. But uh, people were doing a job for the for this country and for the free world, so I, I tip my hat to them. The New Guinea I went to uh, and continue to go to is, is a much more peaceful, a much more amusing and interesting place, a place where you can wander around without having to worry about Japanese snipers and the like. But uh, I want to try to convey to you how important uh, Williams was to this New Guinea story. And, Let's go back to 1957, probably. Uh, I was left in the car by my mother. I was, I was five years old. There was a terrible thunderstorm. She was in the library. People today don't leave children in the car, or even dogs in the car. But back in you know, 1957, it was OK. It was a, she didn't lock me in the car. She just said, I'm going to be back, honey. Stay in the car. She went in the library to get a book, this terrible thunderstorm. And ever, ever after, I was terrified of rain. Not thunder, but rain. So. As a young boy, we went, uh, in a couple years later, we went, uh, it was August of 1959, we went out to a little park north of Baltimore uh, for a summer picnic. It was a steamy, hot night. And my main concern was one thing. There were clouds building on the horizon. And I was probably sitting under uh, the picnic table wondering if it might rain. And, but I happened to gaze up into this tree. So this, in this way, uh, this Rich's story is going to be edited slightly. I gazed up from the picnic table into this dead tree, and there was this bird that I'd never seen before, this red-bellied woodpecker. 
And I had, at that moment, for some strange reason, I basically saw the face of God, or an, I had an epiphany. This woodpecker spoke to me in some unknown way, and my life was changed forever. And you know, in some ways, that brought me to Williams, to Williamstown, and eventually took me to New Guinea. Uh, so let's fast forward to, uh, to Williams. I arrived here in 1970. I was uh, still very young for my age. I was still in the early instar, or larval stage didn't really know what the world meant or what I was supposed to do in the world. I knew I loved birds, I loved nature, and I was conflicted. Uh, I arrived in the biology department, I was going to major in biology and become a biologist. And in essence, uh, the biology department didn't want me, in a nice way, because back in 1970, the biology department's job was to train the future medical doctors, some of who are out there, and I salute you. Uh, and part of the way of training the medical doctors of the world is to torture them as a, at a young age, right? And to filter, yeah, act as a filter. You don't want all these people going to medical school. You have to, there are only so many slots. So in freshman year, you, you know, you whip them and beat them and hope that some of them will uh, whimper and go away, like I did. Uh, I thought I was a biologist. In fact, what I was and what I am today is a naturalist. And there's a difference. A biologist, you know, you can never even have to go outside to be a biologist. You can put on a white lab coat and, and work on some virus in a darkened room looking through an electron microscope. Uh, but I'm a nature person. You know, this morning early, I got up and went up at Greylock and go bird watching. So that's, you know, that's my, uh, my temperament. Well, the wonderful thing about Williams is I didn't need to be a biologist. And I could become a biologist later. So I was rescued by Fred Rudolph and Bob Dalzell, and Lee Drickamer, and Nathaniel Lawrence, who took me under their wing and said, you can be a naturalist, and you can still you know, learn. And uh, you know, as Rich said, I, I was able to sort of skirt the issue of biology by ma majoring in Amer American civilization and doing, still working on birds. So I did my honors thesis on bird life at the Adirondack Park. That was able, I was able to sort of spin a tail to the, uh, the people at Watson Fellowship Group that I really did want to become a bird man somehow, and if you'd give me this fellowship, I'd somehow do something strange and, and get around the strictures of the biology major or what have you. So for some reason, they bought that story, hook, line, and sinker, and, and I was able to go to New Guinea. Now, why New Guinea? This is, here's a young, this young boy at Williams who, had, I'd never been overseas. Why New Guinea? Well, there was a weird family connection. My dad had grown up with a, an, an expert on New Guinea birds named Tom Gilliard. And he always was talking about Tom this, Tom that. Tom was a curator of birds at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And uh, so when it came to select a Watson site, we settled on New Guinea, just because it was about as far away as you can get from here. And I could spin some, again, incredible tale. And uh, it took me to New Guinea. That was the first place I went after I left. The, for the first time I left the United States, I made my way to Papua New Guinea. That's the eastern side of the island. And started a whole new life where I basically became a pupa in, in Papua New Guinea and started to become a real person. You know, Williams got me a, a long way, but uh, New Guinea got me a lot farther. And that eventually took me here. Um, now, I'm going to give you a little bit of propaganda. I work for an organization called Conservation International. Most of you probably haven't heard of Conservation International. We're a bit like the World Wildlife Fund. We were founded 22 years ago, uh, split off from uh, the Nature Conservancy. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the Nature Conservancy. And we focus on uh, nature conservation in 40 of the world's richest countries. I say rich in terms of nature, rich in terms of wildlife, indigenous people, and wonderful places. And part of that is, I, I've split my time over the last 20 years, and really I've been a, a conservation bureaucrat or conservation warrior where you actually do the nitty gritty of conservation, which is, it's sort of like making sausage. It's not pretty, but uh, you get the job done, you get a good sausage, you know, that's not so bad. You get a, a, a national park or a community park or a some sort of protected area. It's very difficult to do. On the lighter side, and what I'm gonna tell you about today is, that you, get, you can, at times, get to go out and be a naturalist, go out and just chase nature. You need to do that because what you really need to do, where you're doing conservation, you want to be able to talk to people about a particular place in the world and explain why it's so special. So you go out and enumerate things. 
you, 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 you identify the plants, you count the birds, you look for the frogs. You, do, you basically go out and play because, you know, this really is, to a naturalist, it's the most wonderful thing you can possibly do. And I'm going to tell you about one of those trips. I've taken probably 25 trips in New Guinea in search of interesting creatures and plants. And this is probably the most fun of, them, of those. And it's the one that's gotten the most uh, sort of uh, buzz. And it really is something I'll never forget. It changed my life, and just like Williams changed my life. And we've done a series of these surveys around the world. But I'm going to talk about the island of New Guinea. And, and not all of you have been to New Guinea. It's the largest tropical island. It's, about, it's a little bit smaller than California. It's divided in half right down the middle. The, the western half, where we're going to go to today, is Indonesia. The eastern half is a country called Papua New Guinea. So most tourists, when they visit New Guinea, they visit the eastern half, which is Papua New Guinea. And I'm now working on a project in Papua New Guinea. Both sides very interesting. Both sides still mostly cloaked in rainforest, indigenous people living in the forests. It's still a little bit like the land that time forgot. Now we're going to head up. So you can see where New Guinea is. If you look just below that box, you'll see the island of Australia or the continent of Australia. New Guinea is attached to Australia. It's part of the same Australian continent. And they are moving northward and bumping into the Pacific plating. And it's basically created lots of big mountains. And we're going to go up into one of those mountains today, a place called the Foya or Foja Mountains. It's in that uh, red oval there. One of the reasons, uh, one of the, there are some series of mysteries that led us to the Foya Mountains. One is this bower bird here on the left, these birds with these beautiful uh, golden crests. One was described in 1897 by Walter Rothschild uh, from some trade skins. If we go back to the 1890s, uh, the ladies of Williamstown and elsewhere, Paris, France, uh, Paris and London, I should say, uh, wore hats with beautiful adornments, often whole birds or bird plumes, aigrettes, birds of paradise and the like. And that created a trade where people, rough and ready people, went out in the far corners of the world and collected birds for ladies' hats. And often they collect strange birds or birds that maybe weren't appropriate for ladies' hats because, you know, the people, the indigenous people who were making the collections didn't really know about ladies' hats. So they collected more or less everything. And now the smart traders, when these boxes of birds arrived back in, in, in this case in Netherlands, arrived, the, the traders would sort them. These, the strange woods would go to the, the husbands who had their own natural history museums or cabinets, the beautiful ones to the ladies. And this one happened to be one of the strange ones that ended up in Lord Walter Rothschild's uh, personal museum in Tring, England. He described it as a new species. The interesting thing is there was no label attached. Where did this bird come from? It came from an un unknown locality. Um, you see some German in the lower right. There was a similar bird that wasn't illustrated when it was described. In 18, uh, two years later, again, a new bird of paradise described from a place unknown. Now, both of these groups of birds, the birds of paradise and bowerbirds, mainly live in New Guinea. So everybody guessed that these birds had come from New Guinea. And basically what started was a race. Naturalists wanted to get back to that place that had produced these fantastic birds in search of other interesting things. So basically this was a sort of a, these birds were pointers saying, come back here and you'll find more new things. And you'll see dates and names here. Uh, over the years, Dylan Ripley and Tom Gilliard and Ernst Meyer, uh, and eventually Jared Diamond, raced around western New Guinea in search from the place that produced that bower bird and that bird of paradise. And it was in 1979 that Jared Diamond, who's now famous, many of you have probably read his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that won the Pulitzer Prize. Jared Diamond is one of these genius types who's not only a concert harpsichordist uh, for many years, he was trained in uh, cell membrane transport physiology, and as a hobby, does ornithology. For that hobby, he's probably published 500 scientific papers, six or seven books, uh, won, won the National Medal of Science, et cetera, et cetera. And so he, not me, was the first to get up into these FOIA mountains that I'm going to talk about today. And we did. We were actually racing at the time. I wanted to get there. I, I didn't have the wherewithal. I simply didn't have the juice to get there. He was able to get there with the World Wildlife Fund to get a helicopter. The key was all these other naturalists couldn't get up into this mountain range because without a helicopter, you simply can't get there. Even today, you can't walk up into these mountains. It's just too rugged. It's too far. There are no roads. There are very few people. There are no traditional walking tracks like there are in most places of New Guinea. So Jared Diamond got there. 
he found the first prize. He was able to document that that bowerbird, uh, the golden-fronted bowerbird, which I'll show you a little bit later. He rediscovered that there. It made a cover of Science Magazine, a lot of hoopla, uh, press conference at the, at the National Geographic Society. This was a big story. Now, we knew there was more to that story. Uh, so Jared had gone up there, had done surveys of birds, and we wanted to go back there and see what else was there. Uh, but it, between when he was there, he went there twice, 1979 and 1981. Between 1981 and our getting there was almost 30, I think it was 30 some years, 33 years, something like that. It took us 33 years to get back there. And that just gives you an idea of how difficult uh, this place is. Because what I'd like to say is, if you like to think about a place that's as far away from here that you can and still be on the earth, this would be I would, one of those places you might nominate. It's, yes, it's physically far, it's also psychologically far, it's also politically far. Just a very difficult place to get to. You can't just sort of buy a ticket and go. And part of getting there is a partnership, a smart partnership that involves the government of Indonesia, because this is Indonesia. And Western New Guinea, or Indonesian New Guinea, some people call it Papua, or West Papua, is a place where we are not really welcome. Scientists are not welcome there. Tourists are not welcome there. Really, no one's welcome there except the people who live there. They don't really want outsiders snooping around. I don't need to go into the details, but it has to do with political politics of separatism and the, the idea of a free West Papua and things like that. So it's really hard to get a permit to go there. It's hard to get a helicopter once you're there. It's hard to move around. You need permissions of all sorts. But with that partnership, we really sort of we were able to get things to the level where we got our first letter, letter from the Indonesian government saying, OK, come on, you can try to get there. We'll let you try. So once you get into the country, you need seven additional permits, or no, nine, excuse me, here it says, five national permits, four provincial permits. Uh, this gives you a little bit of an idea. If you start at the top, if you start in Washington, DC, you fly over to uh, Seoul, Korea, then down to Jakarta. From Jakarta, you're in Indonesia, but then you've got a long way to go to get over to to Western New Guinea. And once you're in the capital of Western New Guinea, which is Jayapura, then you have to uh, charter a small mission aviation plane, which will take you to Cuerba Village. And there you have to hope for a helicopter. So here's the airstrip at Cuerba Village. This is down at the bottom of the foothills. If you look behind, you'll see some greenery. That's the Foya Mountains going up in, in, into the uh, clouds. Now, the Foya Mountains are much like the Berkshires. They're not very tall. New Guinea has mountains that go as high as the snow line, so they have 15,000-foot peaks. These are little bumps, basically. They go to around 7,000 feet, a little bit higher than Greylock. But by New Guinea standards, not very high, not very significant. But this particular mountain range is very isolated. And as you know, if, thinking about Darwin, isolation uh, and tropical conditions produce species. And that's why naturalists like myself and my team wanted to get there, go there to see what's there. So first you have to get your, land, air, your, get your little uh, single-engine Cessna to land on this airstrip. As you see, it looks like a little bit of a, like a, a part of a fairway. Uh, you don't want to come in short on this when there's a little a bit of a cliff, you see, uh, that, that gi gives down to a deep, uh, deep river there. But you hit that cliff and it's all over. So, you know, we're a little bit nervous coming in here. And then you put up in the, at the CI uh, Scientific Field Station, which is this uh, local materials house that we had. Um, another thing, the uh, hurdle to getting up the mountain is the local landowners. Uh, on the left here is Pak Timothy, on the right is Pak Isak. These are the two neighboring village headmen. Uh, Pak Timothy on the left uh, is uh, uh, a Papasena uh, man, he speaks Papasena language. Uh, on the right is Pak Isak, he speaks Kwerba. So these people in, in adjacent villages that are about maybe three days walk from each other speak a different language. And that bespeaks another remarkable thing about the island of New Guinea. It's an air, it's a country, sorry, it's an island with more than a thousand, as many as 1,200 different languages. And as a conservationist, you know, we think of nature and wildlife and things like that. Uh, conservationists involve people too, especially when we talk about forest people, indigenous peoples, peoples that speak their own languages and have their own cultures. Uh, so when we're doing nature conservation in a place like this, it's very much engaging and working with the local indigenous groups, not only to get them to focus on the natural side, which they already have. That's not, a, that's not a stretch for them because they live in nature. They live nature every day. They use nature. They have names, traditional names for all the wildlife, for all the trees. 
So that's not a stretch for them. Um, but to helping them define their future because you know they're out there, there's no road, there's no electricity, uh, you know, there's no telephone. Uh, there, there is a shortwave radio because we brought one in, they could use that to communicate with the capital. But these are people that are right today, they own this huge expanse of rainforest. They're what we'd call in, in Papua New Guinea the Papa Ground. These are the traditional owners. And the future really lies with them. And, and if the past predicts the future, we're in pretty good shape because, of course, we're in an area which is a huge tract of uh, old growth rainforest, about 8 million hectares where we're standing here in Cuerba, surrounded by this huge Mambaramo Basin. This the largest tract of rainforest in the whole Asia Pacific region. Not a single road crossing it today. Think of that. Not a single road. Eight million hectares, about the size of Rhode Island. And these aren't the only people. I mean, there are a number of indigenous groups. There are about 30 indigenous groups in that big basin and includes the Foya Mountains. And they're all trying to figure out how are they going to develop themselves. And so for us, conservation and development are the same thing, one and the same thing. That conversation always includes both how are we going to help ourselves as people and how are we going to help nature? Because they, these people, more than we, understand that water doesn't come from a bottle and food doesn't come from a supermarket, it comes from nature. Uh, these people understand that because they don't have any shops that sell bottled water. So we had to get permission from Timothy and, and Isak, and we've been working there for five years doing a conservation program with them. And so they, after a few years, uh, did agree uh, grudgingly to allow us to go up onto the mountaintop. Well, they didn't want us to go to the very top because that's their sacred site. That's where their ancestors live forever. And so they were a little nervous about actually seeing their ancestors face to face, like we all are. Um, but they said we could go up towards the top because they had none of these people had been there either. That's one of the remarkable things. In most places in New Guinea, the people are mountain people. And they walk everywhere. They, they'll, take the, they'll take a trail, the, the straight line between two points, which may take you over a 12 or 13 or 14,000 foot peak, right over the top, which is not the way we normally, we have switchbacks and hairpin turns. They just go right up over the top. Here, these people are lowland people. They don't know about mountains. They have mountains in their purview and in their ownership, but they basically don't go there. So there are no trails. They don't really know about it. So they were kind of curious to go in there themselves. So we got together this team that included Indonesian students, and we got together at Cuerba. There were about uh, 25 of us, and we wanted to get up here in the clouds here. Up in those clouds, uh, we were hoping to find a camp, uh, establish a camp, and spend a couple of weeks surveying intensively day and night. We actually knew when the helicopter coming wouldn't be able to carry all of us, so we split our team in two. One foothill pe group, which would go up into the foothills, and one sort of high mountain camp. We basically, we voted on it and it split down right in the middle. A lot of people didn't really want to go into those clouds in a helicopter. They had just, a, they were a little bit nervous. Of course, a lot of people haven't flown in a helicopter, a little nervous about it. So that, was made, that made the sort of weeding process uh, pretty straightforward. Now, of course, you can't land a helicopter in rainforest canopy very conveniently. So you need to find a clearing. And, and about 20 years before, I'd flown over this mountain range looking down lusting after those, that forest, hoping to get there one day. And I'd seen this small clearing, which turns out to be a bog. And that's fine. The helicopter pilots in general are nervous. You know, they're a nervous sort. They, they like to stay as helicopter pilots, not as uh, an announcements in the newspaper. So they don't like to land in a bog. So I was the first. We had a series of sorties up the mountain from Cuerba. They come into Cuerba. We'd load the helicopter, they'd go up, try to make their way through the clouds, which sit on the top of the mountain range, of course. That's where we're in here, excuse me. And uh, so they, the first time we went up there, I was by one, the back door. They said, okay, you just, I'll, we'll hover about two feet above the ground, and you jump out and see, uh, you know, see what it's like. See, if, see how, see if you can get a purchase there. And if it's quicksand and you, you sink up to your neck, well, you know, so long, we'll, we'll, we'll head back to Cuerba. But, you know, they did pull into a nice area. I jumped, it was quite firm and, and everything was fine. The problem was the clouds because even on that first sortie up, but, but that was, they came in late. They were supposed to get there at six in the morning. They didn't get there till eight, pilots being what they had an extra cup of coffee or something like that. They had to come for an hour and a half away, of course. And uh, by the time we got there, there were clouds all over this, this clearing. 
And they had to sort of basically bide their time. And each time they came, it was cloudier and clouder. And, and finally, the fourth sortie, which was, had most of our, much of our field collecting gear, it was completely clouded in. The helicopter pilot went around four or five times and then went home. And that was it. So we were, we were there. There was no more helicopter. Silence basically came down, like the cone of silence came down over us. And we were in what I like to say is this lost world. This is a world where there are no trails, there are no Coke cans. Once, maybe twice a week, you'll hear a jet going over, but basically an utter natural silence. And of course, it wasn't silent in the absolute sense. There were birds singing, there were crickets, there were cicadas, there were katydids. There was somewhat of a natural din, but it was this wonderful, peaceful silence. And it was one of the most remarkable experiences for all of us, just being there, standing out in this bog, surrounded by 8 million hectares of forest, and just being there all alone. Really quite a fantastic thing. And of course, rain was coming, because you're on top of a small mountain range in the tropics. We're about three degrees, three and a half degrees south of the equator. To the north of us is the Pacific. To the south is this big, open, lowland jungle basin. So if the rain's not coming from the north, it's going to be coming from the south. So we knew but by noon it would be raining or drizzling. It would be like that Scottish mist we had this morning out here. So we needed to get up a camp. So the first thing you do is we had Cuerba and Papa Santa men with us. We said, okay, let's make a house. Let's make a camp. So they put up these uh, you know, tarps, get some areas where you can throw all the bags. Uh, the individual scientists each had a little mountain tent that you could sleep in. So we all set up our mountain tents and basically try to make ourselves comfortable for a couple of weeks. Now, we didn't have any architects or, 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 or physical designers with us, so we happily, the guys in a hurry, put up these, these series of uh, uh, canopies. They all, they all tilted towards the middle, and so what we had is basically like a big mud wrestling ring in the middle, unfortunately. Nice and dry, like a donut, but in the middle of our campsite was this slightly muddy area. So most of the time, we were wearing rubber boots with rubber pants. But otherwise, the forest itself is spectacular. It's like a forest you'd find up in the mountains in Ecuador or up in the high in the mountains in, 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 in uh, Central Africa. Uh, you know, if any of you have gone to see the gorillas, this forest is a little bit like that up in the uh, Virungas. So when you get up in the equatorial zone where there's a lot of rain and a lot of mist, you get these beautiful mossy forests, or something, some call them elfin woodlands. Just a beautiful, wonderful thing where there's greenery everywhere. There's, there's moss on the ground. There's moss on all the tree trunks. There's moss up in the canopy. And it's not just moss. There are orchids and ferns, all sorts of climbing and clambering things. Quite a fantastic place. But not a single trail. We didn't see any evidence that anyone had been there. We didn't see any evidence that Jared Diamond had been there. We're not really sure where he went. It might have been the same place. But of course, a lot, lot happens in, in 30 years. Uh, we were just there with the birds, in essence. And we just started our job. So we had botanists, we had herpetologists, we had mammologists, we had entomologists, and we had ornithologists, and we basically went to work. And uh, this is, basically we knew time was short, the clock was ticking. The idea is to get out there and, and enumerate whatever you can find. And of course, a lot of it's the role of the die because it's season, there's seasons. What's flowering, what's fruiting, what's active, what's displaying? You basically take what nature gives you. And you, you don't expect to find everything that first time, but, but you, everything you find is interesting. So we found all sorts. So here's a little tiny rhododendron. You can see how small it is. There's a little black ant up at the top of the one on the right. And we found this gigantic white rhododendron. This is the largest rhododendron flower on Earth. It's about six and a half inches in diameter. It's about that size. With a beautiful, wonderful gardenia-like uh, scent. So why would, why would God or why would nature produce a rhododendron like this? a big, white, showy rhododendron. These are actually rhododendrons that focus on being pollinated by bats. So it's nice and large, and it's white. It reflects, so the bats can maybe use some of their sight at night, but also that wonderful gardenia odor, which draws in the bats who are pollinating. Whereas that little red rhododendron, a little tiny one, has, attracts little honey-eater birds. And so what we're seeing here when we go out there, we're basically seeing a symphony and interactions of plants and animals in this wonderful tropical environment. And of course, we're looking for new things. Those two rhododendrons, not new species, interesting species, not new species. The, here, one of the botanists found this new genus, a new genus and species of a large palm. Uh, very excited about that. We happen to have a palm expert with us. I think he found six new species. The frog expert was like, uh, 
he was like a, a pig and shit, pardon the expression. <laughs> because this was frog heaven. You had this wonderful per humid area. It's, it's wet all the time. It's misty all the time. And that's the kind of habitat that frogs like. So we found frogs in the moss. We found frogs in the trees. We found frogs in the canopy. We found, just there were frogs everywhere. We found 40 species there, 20 of them new to science. So our frogman is still in the process of writing those up. And what he tells me is the island of New Guinea is, again, is a frog paradise. There are probably around 600, 700 species of frogs for New Guinea. We've only described 300. So more than half the frogs. So every time you go out, you find new species, but especially in a place like this. So basically, the frogs haven't really kept up with some of the other groups. The birds are very well known by, by, by contrast. Another new species is a little tiny frog that's about maybe a little bit larger than a half an inch long. Again, lives in the moss. It's a genus Albericus, a new species. A chubby little guy, not very big. It looks big here on the screen, but it's only about two and a half, three inches long. It's called Calulops, also a new species. Not only frogs there, there's things called, uh, this is called a forest dragon in the genus Hypsilurus. It looks a little bit like an iguana or a dinosaur. It's about a three and a half feet long, climbs up in the trees, has really sharp claws for climbing, and also very sharp teeth. Very, very fast. You've got to be fast with this guy who will give you a nip. Uh, so I'm sort of ha I'm a happier to be a bird man, not a herpetologist. Other things that give you a nip, this is a giant rat or a woolly rat called Malamis. It's about four and a half pounds. Um, this one has been sedated. It's not, uh, if you couldn't hold a rat like this if it was fully alive, it would take one of your fingers off at the knuckle, probably. Uh, but uh, this is also a new species, apparently, and a little pygmy possum. You know, we're in, we're in the Australian region here, so the mammals, there are no deer, there are no squirrels, there are no cats, there are no monkeys. We're in Australian region, so there are possums and, uh, and kangaroos and wallabies and things like that. This is, the world, this is one of the smallest of the possums. It's called a pygmy possum. Uh, this was uh, not a new species, but a new record from the North Coastal Range. Again, the size, about the size, a little bit larger than a white-footed mouse, just as cute as can be, caught by one of the local guys by hand, and just completely docile. Uh, a wonderful thing to handle. Now, there's some weird mammals there, too. Really, really weird mammals. This is probably, I, I would submit that this is the most bizarre mammal on Earth. Uh, it's in the group, the monotremes. Those are the mammals you may recall from Bio 101 or Bio 102, the mammals that lay eggs. You know, we know the duck-billed platypus. Some of you may have seen a duck-billed platypus in Australia. This is actually called an echidna, or spiny anteater. Now, let me tell you how. So it lays an egg. Uh, it doesn't, unlike all other mammals, it doesn't have actual breasts. It has no teats for the babies to feed. It, it just it has, has pores that, that, that bleed milk. So the babies have to lap the milk off its, uh, off its uh, breast. It has a poison claw on the hind claw. It has one, of the, one of its claws on the hind foot is poison. It's got this long snout that looks like a, a snout. It's actually its jaw, a toothless jaw, not a single tooth. Uh, it uses that sort of like a poker. It walks around listening for earthworms, apparently. It's, of course, as you can see, very close to the ground. Listening for earthworms, it hears the movement of an earthworm, and it drills down with that poker. And then it uses, it has a long, extensible tongue that has, re, it's rebarbed. It has barbs on the tip and has uh, little points. And it spears earthworms and sucks them up like spaghetti. So somewhat specialized. Now, <laughs> just somewhat. As you can see, it's, it's sort of bat-like. Look at its eyes, it barely see. It basically goes around, it, it lives by hearing and by smell. Doesn't do much, it doesn't bother much with seeing. The problem for this creature today is that hunting has essentially wiped this particular species out. This is a large hunk, what the local people would say, a large hunk of meat. It weighs about 30 pounds, adult weighs about 30 pounds, so it's, it's the most tasty mammal in all of New Guinea, and as a result has been consumed for the last 40,000 years. Unlike some of its close relatives who have gone extinct in New Guinea, this one's teetering. It's still there, but teetering on the brink. And it only can be found in places far, far from human villages. Now, you might wonder, how do the local people find these? They're often nocturnal. They may be hiding. Local people, they just go out with a bow and arrow or, or a spear, and they take hunting dogs. And of course, hunting dogs are relentless. They can smell 
mammals are, give off an odor. Hunting dogs can find these anywhere, anytime. These do burrow in the ground. They'll dig down in the hole, but again, the dog just points, indicates where it is, and they can just dig it up. This is basically the, their supermarket, and this is one of the prime. This is like the sirloin steak of New Guinea. And as a result, this one is, for, for conservationists, is of, of, of grave concern. And also, but very good for us to see, well, here's a large area of forest where no people go that's a reserve for this and the next species I'm going to tell you about. This one's not quite so strange, but still is a strange mammal. It's called a tree kangaroo. It is a, a true kangaroo. It's in the Macropodidae, the kangaroo family, except it lives in trees. So, you know, we envision tree kangaroos out on the plain, out in the savannas of Australia, hopping about at high speed. Well, there isn't any savanna in New Guinea. It's all covered in rainforest. So what do you do? Well, you go up in a tree. That's where all your food is. So the, these tree kangaroos live up in the canopy of forest. They eat orchids and ferns and other little vines and fresh leaves that live up in the canopy. They come down to move sometimes from tree to tree, or they come down to such, some mistakenly try to escape from human hunters. This is the rarest. This is even rarer than that echidna. This was a species that was only discovered in 1994 in Papua New Guinea, on the eastern side of New Guinea. We discovered it for the first time in Indonesia. So this is not a new species. This is called the golden mantled tree kangaroo. It's not a new species, but it's a new species, a new species record for the, the country of Indonesia, a new large mammal. So we were very, very excited about that. Moreover, because we knew, uh, Tim Flannery, who described this species, said, I'm describing these species, and it's teetering on the brink of extinction. It may be extinct by the time the paper is published. Well, luckily, there's a population of this particular species up in these Foya Mountains, again, where no hunters go. So it's a natural reserve. Uh, so we're, as conservationists, very, very happy to know that this particular species, very beautiful and wonderful, little known, has a place where it can live for a uh, time to come. Yes, our entomologist found new species. The, uh, virtually every butterfly he captured was a new species, which he has already named. He named this one after Christiani, after the first lady of Indonesia. Good politics to do that. And when you put up on a, a, a white sheet at night and shine a black light at it, an ultraviolet light, this is what you get. Many of these are new species. I, I think he's, uh, he's arranged the description of some 75 new species of moths and butterflies since that, since that trip. And he's been, actually been back once since and collected additional new things. So moths in the rainforest, again, another totally unknown and wonderful thing. You put up the sheet and all this stuff comes out of the dark and some of the things you know and most of the things you don't even know what the heck they are. So again, uh, for a naturalist, it's one of these wonderful discoveries. You can do the same thing in Ecuador, you can do the same thing in Africa. Uh, there's a big backlog. There are more moths uh, in a place like New Guinea than all other ma animals, all other, at least vertebrates, birds and mammals and, and frogs put together. Tens of thousands of species. Now, I'm a bird man, so it wouldn't be fair if I didn't show you some birds. I'm sure there's some bird people out there somewhere. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about the birds there. This is one, again, caught by hand at night. One of the guys went out with a flashlight. Uh, and this was just perched in a branch. He just gently grabbed it with his hand and put it in a bag and brought it back for photography. Uh, it's not a new species. Nothing particularly special about it, except it's extraordinary, extraordinarily beautiful. It's called the ornate fruit dove. It's got another uh, 15 sister species that live in the area that are all just as beautiful, but look slightly different. Now, this is interesting, not as beautiful, certainly, but uh, equally interesting to ornithology. This was one of the first birds that we saw. The mammologist, when we jumped out of the helicopter, uh, after about 10 minutes, he bumped into a bird that he said looked like a chicken. It had these weird little waddles on the side of its face. Uh, I didn't see it at the time. I didn't see it for about a week. Uh, but I had no idea what it was until I saw it, and it turned out to be a new species of honey eater, uh, which, uh, again, uh, good politics. I named it after my wife, Carol, who's not here today, I'm sorry to say, uh, which uh, got me considerable brownie points. We were up there for Thanksgiving Day. She was actually at her in-laws, at my family, in Baltimore suffering through one of those interminable Thanksgiving dinners. Well, I was out collecting birds in, in uh, New Guinea. So I was able to bring this back as a peace offering to her. And it, uh, the brownie points have still have continued. She's still treating me pretty well. <laughs> you don't get a new bird named after you every day, so you have to, you know, it's a, not so bad. 
Now this is a weird bird. This is a, uh, not a new species, but one of the, this is the largest of the birds of paradise. You can't really see much of it. it birds of paradise often display in a prominent place, like on the top of a branch. Here's a dead, a dead stub. This male bird of paradise uh, will come here every morning before dawn. He'll get there around 5 o'clock, 5.15, and he'll sing and display to the female. And I'll show you a little tape of this here. Let's have a watch. Here he comes now. Now, he'll give a loud boop, 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 that you can hear from about a, a half a mile away. And basically, he's saying, I'm here, come see me. And he does this weird display, opens his mouth and becomes essentially Batman. Here's the female. She's come in. And he's basically trying to wow her, tell her he's the sexiest thing on earth. And he's not far wrong, really. I mean, look at that. I mean, can you imagine being able to do that? We can't quite do that. And uh, presumably she's impressed. Uh, she didn't really want to have sex in front of the camera, so she went away that day. But uh, that's the kind of thing you can see in a place like this. Uh, another bird of paradise, this is this lost bird of paradise, Berlepsch's six-wired bird of paradise. Uh, this was one of our other wonderful discoveries. We weren't sure whether we were going to find it up there. We thought, because Jared had found the bower bird up on this mountain, maybe this lost bird of paradise would be there. And indeed it was. And indeed it was a, a good species, a new species. And so this was, an, again, one of these fantastic things. All these birds of paradise with these beautiful plumes do wonderful displays. I, I don't have any video to show you today of that. But it dances around on the ground. It makes a, a display with a, a, it does, uh, basically turns itself into a ballerina with a skirt on the ground and does a dance for the female. Really quite wonderful. He's got these weird wires that stick out the back of his head. Those are modified head plumes. He can throw those forward and brush the face of the female to titillate her. He, actually, there, there's beautiful little plumes on the end that he actually brushes her with to get her attention. Now, I mentioned Jared's uh, bowerbird, and that's this. This is the golden-fronted bowerbird that does a display. It builds this so-called tower of love, this tower of sticks. It's about maybe four feet high, maybe three or four or five hundred sticks. He stacks up, and he does a display for the female. This is his bachelor pad. These, these, these birds are perennial bachelors. They never get married in, the, in the, our sense of the word. And they're always in play. And they do a display for about seven months of the year where they're trying to mate as, with as many females as possible. This is an extreme form of polygamy. And let me show you what he does to attract the female. Well, first I'll show you. There's that tower. Not very attractive, but he builds a circular runway at the base. He brings all sorts of fruit. You can see all these, stack, these fruits uh, on the right side of the runway that are, that are pale blue. He also has a blue, he puts blue, little tiny blue fruit in the base of the, of the display tree. I mean, sorry, the, the Tower of Love. And he holds a blue fruit in his bill when he does a display. The males on the left, you can see his uh, orange, uh, orange crest. The female, you, hard to see on the right side, she's sitting on a little sort of an observation stick on the right side. And in this case, the male's actually hiding from the female on purpose. He's, he, he's hiding from her behind the bower and making these weird sounds and imitating the sounds of, the, of wind and gravel and other birds and just, again, trying to impress her. Now, why would he hide from the female? He wants to mate with the female. Well, he's playing hard to get. And that's things birds normally don't do. Is he's very good at this, and apparently that, that, that has its proper effect. And so here's, here's a look at his display. You'll see this is sort of the high point of his display when he actually changes his crest into a crown and does this ridiculous display. <laughs> and what, what female would, could, how, how could you resist that if you're a female? <laughs> really quite something. And there she is. She doesn't look that impressed. And actually, as, as, as an evolutionary biologist, the, the, the project is, I mean, when you look at these birds, the male's job is to be sexy and to be out there. The female's job is to be reserved and be choosy. She wants, so she goes from display tree, from dis, they're males scattered all through the forest. The female is basically shopping around. Who's the sexiest male? Who's the male that's going to give me the sexiest genes that'll produce new males that'll carry, that'll carry on my lineage? She's being very, very choosy. She's being very careful. He'll mate with anything. She's going to mate with the sexiest male. So two weeks goes by very quickly. And, of course, at that point, you, 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 know, you're, you, you want some more time there, and yet you don't want to spend Christmas there. You know, it's still November. 
and it's cloudy every every morning, and it's cloudy, and it's raining in the afternoon. You say, "Is the helicopter going to come and get us?" And it wasn't easy, actually. It took a it took a few tries for the helicopter to get in, and we loaded this helicopter. It went up into the clouds. It couldn't find itself. It had to actually come back. It was a little bit frightening going into where you don't see anything, and had to make we had to make our way, and then spend more time waiting for the clouds to open to get out. So, you get into one of these beautiful places, not so easy to get out, and. Uh, but we we did. We got out. It took us two days to get out. And we had a celebration down in the village. We ate all the excess rice. We had 40 or 50 kilos of rice. We ate it in a single night. All those instant noodles we cooked up. A big party. The big party, the big, big party, though, came in February 2006 when we put out a press release. And uh, surprise to us, normally we try to tell our story as naturalists. And... Uh, it doesn't really uh, attract much attention. There might be a squib in the local paper of maybe four lines. Biologists discover a new species. End of story. This particular story, for some reason, we don't really know why, uh, basically created its own sustainable sort of groundswell and circled the globe and sort of complete, and basically got the attention of the world. Uh, now, why is that significant? Well, it's significant to us because that never happens to us. So it's kind of fun. Well, that's uh, the other significance is though was what it, it actually gave us a platform, a voice, where we could actually speak to the world. We could tell things to the world, and the world will listen. And again, that's not something that w we, as conservationists or biologists, get all the time, because you know there are every, a lot of people t talking out there, a lot of people looking for attention, but most of us don't have time to listen. And to be able to have that platform was actually one of the most precious things that we got, that I got and that CI, Conservation International, got from this, this little expedition we took to the Foya Mountains. Because there were people ready to listen, people with tape recorders ready to record what we had to say. So every, every moment when we spoke to these reporters and to the press was a precious opportunity to basically try to, to talk to you, basically. Talk to you, the people of the world, and say, look at this place, look at this area, look at this country, this is important. And at the same time, we were talking to the president of Indonesia, getting in to the minister for environment, telling those stories. They paid attention. The Indonesian government were excited by this story. They even did a stamp series that they, they printed, which is kind of fun. It's got my wife's honey eater there and the bowerbird and the new palm. So that doesn't happen to a biologist every day, too. Again, again, fun telling that story. And for some reason, it got the, got the attention of 60 Minutes. We tried to talk them down. We said, it's just too difficult. How are you going to get there? Where are you going to get the helicopter? What's going to happen? It might rain for two weeks. They said, no, 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 we're going to do it. We're going to do it. So we grudgingly said, OK, you're going to do it. But you know, we just wanted them to understand the situation. And things, for some reason, fell in place. When the 60 Minutes crew arrived in, in Indonesian New Guinea, we had no helicopter. They, were, they arrived, they stayed in the hotel. At that point, we had no helicopter. And within two days, we, someone loaned, was able to loan us a helicopter. And they had, a, in fact, had, had a free helicopter. They brought a big bag of money to pay for the helicopter, because as you may know, helicopters are not inexpensive. We had a loaned, they had a free helicopter for two weeks. And they were able to do the things they wanted to do. They, they made that wonderful, those wonderful videos and more. They actually completely surprised us, us jaded, cynical biologists. They did the job they were do, wanted to do. And again, they told, they told a nice story. They were, they were in, uh, entertained by the Papasena villagers when they flew in. They smeared our face with mud and the like. And weather smiled on us, allowed us to get, into, get in and out of the, uh, the, the bog and get back up there. Uh, and again, this particular, you know, you might think it's a nuisance sitting down with Bob Simon and having not to, you know, stumble over your words. But again, this is one of those precious moments for me as a scientist, being able to talk directly to the world, to, to say things, get messages out there. And uh, you know, I consider it one of the most precious, you know, sort of success stories of, of my career, to be able to talk to the world that way. We even went back and did another wrap to basically finish up. We did that last November and December. Uh, I didn't go. I went out there and got basically uh, launched the wrap, got it going, got the helicopter in place, and sent all, a whole new team of biologists up, up into the mountains. And they had a horrible time. It was a, a nightmare. It rained every day. It rained day and night. The, the camp they had was a morass of mud. 
Uh, they had all sorts of trouble with the helicopter coming in. They had to wait days for the helicopter to come back. So it doesn't always work out like it did for 60 minutes. But they did get back, and they brought back, again, more new species, more discoveries, more exciting things. And we haven't actually told that story to the world yet. We doubt it will get the same impact, of course, because people are a little bit tired of that story. But we've, And now we've basically closed that chapter on this exploration of this faraway place. And I just want to wrap up with some, some take-home points. One is, you know, we drive down this main street here today, we drive to Boston, we drive to Albany. The world is known. Everything's all wrapped up. Is it? No, of course it's not. We don't know our world that, that well. This Foya Mountains is a special place, but we brought back probably somewhere between 100 and 200 new species to science, not yet with names. Only a few of them have been named yet. There are lots of places in the world like that. Our world is not as well known as we'd like to think. And the processes that, that make the world a wonderful place, we don't really understand that well. The whole issue of climate change that we're just coming to understand today, these are serious stories, and I would submit to you that the idea of spending billions to go to Mars, we've seen the pictures of Mars, it's a perfectly nice place, but it's not Earth. Spending billions of dollars to go to Mars when in fact we should be taking that money and studying, new people should be studying the Purple Valley, should be studying the Adirondacks, should be studying the, the wonderful natural places we have here in the United States as well as overseas. There's so much work yet to be done. And also change. Uh, the world is changing. You know, that, that, that place we went in the Foya Mountains, that has all these unique species there because of change. That mountain range is one of the youngest mountain ranges in New Guinea. We can essentially see it moving up out of the ocean. Three and a half million years ago, that mountaintop was under sea. If you go to the top of the mountain and kick the dirt, what you find is deep uh, shales and, and, and mudstones that were three or 4,000 feet under the ocean. That's moved up. It's created a new environment like an island that's, a, that's drawn in new uh, populations of species that have isolated and speciated right there. That's change. Things are all in change. And in a changing world, it means how much less we know because we used to live, when I was here at Williams, we lived in a static world. The geology course I took here didn't talk about plate tectonics. It talked about a, a world that didn't change. It's almost a biblical world. And now we know everything is in change. And that means our job of maintaining and, and stewarding this world, caring for this world, is that much harder because we have to anticipate that change. Now, the, one, the last take-home point I want to really press uh, to you is, well, let's go back three hours. Where was I? I was up on the top of Greylock. What am I, nuts? Where were you guys? You guys were all maybe stretching or taking a shower or... Uh, getting ready to go to breakfast, something like that. But um, it, was a, it was a little bit wet. It was a little bit misty. I didn't see any of you up there, by the way. <laughs> but the, the, the myrtle warblers were singing, and the, the, the dark-eyed juncos were singing, and the, the purple finches were singing, and the balsam firs were just sort of moving slightly in the breeze. It was spectacular. And that place, you know, Greylock, is just some wonderful... It's a lot like the precious... Foya Mountains. You have wonderful places here that we tend to take for granted. And in essence, every community has these wonderful, special, sometimes forgotten places that it's our job to care for, to look after, and to make sure are protected for those future generations. And, and to do that, to really understand, we do need to get up. You need to get up in the morning. You need to go outside, take your binoculars. You may not know all the birds. Just get out there and have a look. And then, you know, you may find, it's like looking up and seeing that red-bellied woodpecker, you'll be captured by something new that'll change your life. And then you, in turn, can change that world. And, you know, there's some young people in the audience, I'm talking to them, but also people the class of 74 or before. You can still change that world. And I'm working at Conservation International. My job is not only to have fun and go to cool places like this, but is to change the world for the better and to conserve those best places. And I really want you to do the same thing. Thanks very much.